All right. Thank you. So uh, my name is James Galtieri. I'm going to talk to you a, a little bit today about uh, some very interesting research, or at least interesting to me, um, that I did as part of GE Healthcare. Um, I work in enterprise imaging, which is sort of downstream from the devices that uh, Lizette was discussing earlier today, the modalities, they take the pictures um, and then radiologists read those images to make a diagnosis. And then those diagnoses are read by clinicians um, uh, like um, Melissa and, um, you know, and the surgeons and other kinds of uh, clinicians that uh, Tim and Barbara talked about earlier today. And, you know, my job is to present the information to them in as clear a way as I can. And, um, okay, and you're changing uh, things. So, so this uh, slide, this, this uh, quote is sort of what drove, drives what I do. I think that, you know, getting clinical touch points is important, extremely important. And we wanna do it as frequently as we can. Um, I am lucky in that GE Healthcare has had a long-standing relationship with the hospital system here in Pittsburgh, UPMC, and we will have radiologists and clinicians come into our workspaces a couple of times a week, a couple of times a week to um, read images as well as provide feedback on the current designs. So, if you go to the sort of next screen, okay, this is this is me. Um, I'm a senior staff user experience designer at GE Healthcare. I'm sometimes an undercover radiologist, clinician, or rad tech. And I have 20 years experience uh, developing artifacts that users wield to understand their world and interact with it. So next, please. Okay, so the challenge um, is that GE's products have been built primarily with user input from Western academic institutions. These are large um, hospital systems with hundreds of radiologists and thousands of clinicians. Um, and they're great. I mean, I don't want to uh, discount these products at all. They're, they're fabulous. But, you know, the needs and the workflows of a radiologist or clinician in Boston and San Francisco are not the same as the needs of someone working in Nairobi, or Asif, or Surkata, or Regalia. Um, and we needed to go out and collect information from users at these other locations to find out to what extent um, were our tools supporting their needs and supporting uh, the work that they wanted to do. So if you could go ahead. Next slide, please. So before I sort of go in and talk to you about um, sort of the research that we did and, and some of the um, changes that we made or changes that are we, we are proposing in the process of making as a result of this, I wanted to give you sort of a, a quick overview of our product ecosystem. So, and it is an ecosystem, right? And actually missing from this is the, the front end um, devices that are taking the pictures um, uh, with the possible exception of um, the one tool uh, media manager, which is used to capture natural light images for like burn cases, wound care, um, pre-op, post-op photos and interop photos. Um, and I've worked on sort of all of these products over the course of my time at, at GE. So um, the workhorse of the system is, um, Workflow Manager and Universal Viewer. Um, that is the uh, tool that is used primarily by radiologists, uh, and it is used. Um, and they, you know, there's it's it's the power tools of the uh, of the suite. Um, the piece that I'm going to focus on for this talk is the Clinician Imaging Viewer, um, Zero Footprint Viewer, and it has the benefit is in that it is a um, HTML page. Um, you can access images via your phone, via a tablet, via desktop. It does not require the installed hardware 
that uh, the Universal View and Workflow Manager has. Um, so it is um, ideally suited for us to roll out to users in the, um, you know, developing countries where they may not have the hardware infrastructure needed to support these, these, these heavyweight tools. Um, all of our tools are connected to you know, multiple data backends, which presents its own set of challenges. So you know, PAC systems, federal neutral archives, um, as well as XDS uh, databases. So go ahead, please. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna focus on the research that we did, um, this global research that we did around zero footprint viewer. And this is an enterprise viewer and it is built for clinicians. Um, they you know, allow the user to pick the device that they wanna view the images on and they can do everything from very simple tasks with this viewer to some more complex tasks with this view, um, viewer. So they can look at key images, uh, images that a radiologist has identified as sort of, you know, the most important ones, as well as, you know, looking at, you know, a patient's entire imaging history. They can review a report or they can access some powerful tools, um, 3D tools, um, smart layouts, um, access to some AI uh, results within all within this application. And we have this um, product, this sort of two versions. One is a standalone or as a, um, uh, as a viewer from an EMR. So go ahead. So here is a, um, a sample workflow. Um, I apologize for difficulty reading this. This is a workflow um, using our um, imaging products for a surgeon, so much like uh, some of the work um, I'm, that Tim was discussing earlier. Um, um, but you know, this is it is fairly complex. When and we wanted to go out and validate these workflows, we have probably on the order of thirty or forty workflows that um, that we're looking to support for different types of clinicians. And we just wanted to see whether or not the workflows that we were seeing here at these academic institutions in the West, and primarily U.S., Canada, and Europe, um, apply to um, developing uh, country to apply to users at developing countries around the world. So go ahead, next. All right, so what we're trying to do is avoid uh, situations like we see in this photo here where we've got power outlet and a plug and they just don't fit. And, and we're, as we were collecting feedback from our clinical application specialists, we were getting hints um, at that, that maybe the tools and how we were per, um, how we had designed the UI and the UX um, for our systems were not uh, matching with the mental models of our users in these other developing countries. So um, you know, our hypotheses about work as imagined in these countries um, was useful, but um, did not necessarily match work as done um, in these in these developing countries. So we proposed and was accepted um, uh, a plan to go out and collect some information from these countries. So I was extremely lucky in that uh, I was able to be part of this. I didn't get to go on all of the trips, but we talked with um, over 100 clinicians at 34 institutions in 12 countries. Um, we did a mix, a mix of ethnographic observations as well as one-on-one um, uh, -on -one interviews or group interviews with um, user needs to identify their user needs and pain points. Um, and you know, the goal, the primary goal of this work was to go out and identify ways that we might modify, improve, tailor ZFP to the needs and workflows of these other users. All right, go ahead. Next, please. I'm 
waiting. Oh, wow. So this is, whoops, can we go back one? So this is a map of um, sort of all of the sites that we went to uh, during these trips. I'm hoping the rest of the audience is getting a better picture than I am. Um, I think, you know, I, Theo, I think maybe the problem was I just don't have a great connection and it's slow because it's taking literally tens of seconds for the screen to refresh and get to something clear. And that might have been our problem. All right. So, the, so again, we, you know, we went to South America, Africa, Asia um, to get these insights on, on, on the user needs. And so go ahead. So um, these trips took uh, probably a total of four months um, in that last year. Luckily, no COVID last year. If we had planned these trips for this year, we would have not gotten to go, which would have really been sad. Um, and we collected a tremendous volume of data. We have um, pages and pages of notes and photos and video and um, the team um, sort of after the last session um, was conducted went and we spent a fair amount of time um, going through that, culling, culling through those items, trying to identify sort of shared pain points across the different si sites to help um, prioritize the work that, that needed to be done to make changes to, to ZFP. I'm going to talk next to about sort of five areas, five assumptions that we had about how we thought um, ZFP might be used and, uh, and talk about sort of the design changes that we're proposing in order to address uh, these issues. So if you go to the next slide, um, we have sort of uh, more than five uh, assumptions uh, that we're we're addressing, but these are the top five. Uh, these are the things that we're sort of actively working to um, to address. So we had some assumptions, right? That we assumed that most users wanted access to the same set of tools. So you know, today we um, and I'm going to discuss these in sort of more detail. We also assumed that um, most users wanted access to sophisticated viewing capabilities and that they had access to diagnostic quality monitors um, and that there was uh, on-site storage and, and good uh, transmission uh, technology at the institutions. And then finally, we assumed that the care team all worked for the same institution. And as you'll see in the next coming set of slides, none of these assumptions held true. So um, most users want access to the same set of tools. Um, so there are some fairly um, standard tools. Um, the chart here is uh, a profile, um, is one clinician profile um, in terms of how important and how frequently they used a particular set of tools. So, you know, this particular clinician uses window width, window level a lot. Um, um, they use a ruler for making measurements a lot, and then they use the ellipse tool for measuring areas. Um, but different clinician profiles use different sets of tools. So, you know, we've come to realize that we can't roll out with just sort of a single set of tools. And oh, by the way, it's all of the tools in the toolbox um, for everyone that our users are better able to use our software if we tailor the tool set to the user. And it's not to say that all those other tools aren't available to them, but they're one or two clicks away as opposed to sort of sitting at sitting and staring them in the face. All right. Um, we're also seeing sort of regional and institutional differences in sort of what tools they want to use and, and how they want to use them. So we're seeing, um, you know, different workflows, different tool utilization. We're going to need to be far more uh, configurable than we are today. All right. 
So one of the things that we're working on now is a profile-based configuration um, that's based on user needs. So we'll do um, uh, user interviews with sort of a, a, a class of clinician as well as clinicians within a region and or country. And then we will roll out sort of a tool set that is tailored to them um, as its default settings. And then if they want to go in and, and change it, they can. Um, and that's the other thing that we're allowing is we're allowing far more customization in ZFP than we did before. At uh, um, two years ago, the customization was only permitted at the institution level. We now permit um, uh, customization down at a, a user level. Now, you know, just because we went out on sort of this one set of discovery trips, um, we, you know, didn't answer all the questions. We have additional questions um, that are needed. Um, right now, we've got, uh, I'll say, a half dozen uh, templates worked out. Um, there is a question of how many more do we need? I mean, we don't, are, are not going to do a template for every single person, country, pair, but we need to figure out sort of how many, we, how many more we do need. So that's sort of ongoing work and stuff that we'll, we'll need to continue to, to look into. And go to the slide 14, please. Um, next assumption was that users wanted access to sophisticated viewing capabilities. Um, I'm not going to say ZFP is a, um, uh, has feature creep, but there, you know, um, over the years it has become fairly weighty with the number of uh, workflows and tools that are available to its users to use, um, which means that it takes, you know, originally, when it was originally designed, it was meant to have walk-up usability. Um, it now requires probably a day of training to use most of the tools. And if you wanted to be use some of the more sophisticated tools, that would take um, uh, a, a significant um, a significant amount of additional training, right? Uh, when we went out and we talked with the these folks at the different uh, uh, developing country sites, they're you know they're saying that they hit, see a high turnover in clinicians, um, and so that means that you know they don't have time to train people um, as you know each round each each batch of folks come in. Um, they also have sort of limited, um, some sites, especially some of the remote sites, have limited network capabilities. So the more information that needs to get pushed, um, the harder it is for those images to get transmitted. So what we, um, uh, we need to have uh, sort of a, a very, very simple viewer that has, that's easy to learn and a few basic tools that's going to be acceptable sort of most of our users in these, especially sort of general practitioners don't need a whole lot, but, you know, we were giving them a whole lot. Uh, uh, you know, we've given them the entire Swiss army knife when all they really needed was sort of a, a single knife to whittle. So, you know, we're looking to build simpler, faster, more stable viewing product that is, um, has a, you know, uh, has sort of the minimum footprint um, possible. Um, and again, minimum tools to sort of reduce loading times. And the other thing that we're looking to do is as you sort of add tools to your tool, toolkit, we're doing, we wanna do that in sort of an intelligent way so that as you expand your capabilities, um, the UI UX is consistent. So if you go from, sort of uh, a phone level viewer at home and then, you know, looking at a desktop version at work that they are, they look the same, they work the same. So um, we're, we have gotten our, you know, we've identified sort of what we think is a relatively small tool set might be possible to get it down smaller. We'd like to do some additional research to see if we can get it sort of smaller still. All right, go ahead and uh, next. All right, so this uh, give you an example of sort of what um, the standard ZFP looks like today. You can see there's you know fairly 
complex amount of information. We've got an awful lot of um, uh, corner text, uh, text overlays on top of the images, um, a lot of tools, and I'm not even showing you the toolbar sort of up, up above the top of the browser. So go ahead and do the next screen, please. All right, so um, in the US um, and, and, and I think most of Europe, um, radiologists require, desire, diagnostic quality monitors in order to make a diagnosis. Um, and if you've ever been into the, sort of a radiologist reading room, they're caves and not only do they have one monitor, but they could have two, three, four, I've seen as many as six um, monitors in front of a radiologist workstation, many of them Barco six megapixel monitors, you know, with really, really good, um, you know, quality screens. Um, but when we went out and we talked with um, the radiologists and clinicians at some of these developing locations, um, they were saying that, you know, about 80% of exams, they thought they could read on their phone. Now, you know, granted, my iPhone has gotten a lot better than what it was five years ago, but I was shocked to think that there were that there were radiologists who thought they could make a diagnosis off of my phone. Um, we find that younger clinicians are more willing to do this than um, the older uh, clinicians. And um, we we'll also find that places where the infrastructure is poor, the users are more willing to, to make those diagnoses over the phone just because they have access to it. So a diagnosis today is better than, you know, a, a, a questionable diagnosis today or a decision today is better than a decision that, you know, they may not, you know, may not, they may not go into the institution, but once a week. So being able to make those decisions quickly is better than waiting until they have access to that, that better hardware. Um, as a result of this um, of this work, we have um, expanded our mobile viewing solution. Um, before, we were just able to send a link and view a single study on your phone. We're looking at providing access to the entire patient history, as well as some of the other navigation capabilities that exist in the product today on a phone, so that everything um, that you can do today on desktop, you can do in a native way on the phone. Um, uh, moving forward, we'd like to identify and want to identify what types of exams are amenable to diagnosis on a phone and which types of um, cases do you really need to come in and, and use one of these um, workstation setups to do an effective diagnosis. And that's, that's just, that's ongoing work that we need to continue to do. Next, please. Okay, um, so we assumed that, you know, um, development countries, they have hospitals, they have hospital systems, they have, um, you know, they're going to have storage and transmission capabilities. Um, and they do to some extent. Um, unfortunately, at many of the sites we went to, they only ever um, keep six months worth of imaging history on their servers. Um, imaging files are large and servers are, well, you know, relatively inexpensive, they're not free. So, and it, even if you move to a cloud solution, there is a cost with, up, you know, maintaining that presence in the cloud. So, um, you know, what we take for granted, uh, in the US and Europe, having access to sort of all of your imaging history um, is not true in, in many places around the world. In fact, some places like Brazil, um, they're required to print um, the images so that there is a permanent record available someplace. Um, in many locations, um, the patients are given a CD or even films um, to take home to maintain their uh, own records. So the you know personal health records that we were you know that were discussed earlier today would really be useful in in uh, in the developing world, I think. Um, and then you know 
The other issue is that many users have sort of unreliable connectivity issues. Um, so in order to sort of better serve the needs of our users, right, we need, needed to improve our exam input and export capabilities, right? So, you know, when you're discharged, you need to be able to get a copy of your, of your files, and that means burning them to a DVD or CD. Um, and then, you know, if you remember to bring them the next time you go in, um, we need to have a way of getting them back into the hospital system's uh, databases. So we need to, you know, support ad hoc uh, 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 study creation um, sort of quickly on the fly with minimum clicks. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things we're looking at in personalized um, health records is, is one of the areas we're exploring, um, I, I think is, would be really, is, is going to be really important. Next. All right, and then sort of last, the last topic I wanna talk about today, assumption I wanna address is that the care team all works for the same institution. So UPMC, um, Boston's um, hospitals, UW, any number of institutions around, at least in this country, the radiologist, the clinician, everybody basically works for the same parent company. We get these large uh, conglomerations where everyone, you know, at least theoretically has access to the shared data stores and has the ability to um, reach out, you know, walk down the hall, um, in many cases, walk down the hall, or at least pick up the phone and talk to the other members of the care team. Um, that is less the case in um, many developing countries. Uh, uh, one of the one of the folks we talked to in uh, Kenya, the radiologist was um, an on call radiologist. So uh, he worked at one institution during the day, did read studies for another institution at night. Um, and frequently those studies were sent to that second institution from another country, from a imaging center in another country. Um, and so they had to, that report had to get back to that um, second country. Um, uh, so that was that some significant challenges um, uh, for the patient, uh, making sure that the information that is collected um, uh, on them, um, that any decisions that are any diagnoses that have been made get transmitted to the clinician so that they can develop a treatment plan for that um, for that person. So we've we've built in or building in um, some uh, in-app chat capabilities so that we can better tie communications for that care team together. And then we're looking at um, see if we can ident identify a standardized set of sort of questions, prompts to make it sort of even quicker for them to be able to send messages back and forth between one another. All right, go ahead. All right, so those are the sort of things that we learned that are going to sort of directly impact our product and how we make changes to the product. But um, I also wanted to take a little bit of time to sort of go over some of the sort of insights that we had in terms of collecting, uh, of conducting global research. This is something that uh, I had never done before and and I'm, I'm guessing, and I feel very fortunate to have been, been able to do that. And I want to share some of the things that we learned um, as part of that. So go ahead and next slide, please. All right. Um, first and foremost, everything takes more time than's planned. Now, I know this is true in the developing world as well, but this is sort of doubly true in in um, in emerging markets. Um, you need to always expect the unexpected. The um, this is a this is a photo of um, you know one of many. Um, uh, times we did not make it to a session on time because of traffic. Um, so make sure that, you, you know, if you have an opportunity to do global research, spend, leave yourself extra time for 
for these engagements. Um, and while it's important to have a plan, you should make sure that you're willing to let the research go off track and have the let the users sort of tell you what is um, important to them. Because um, no matter how much planning you've done, there are going to be things that are locally relevant that, that you will not have thought of. Um, um, in addition, uh, bilingual communication adds sig significantly more time to a session. So a session that you might be able to do in your native language in 30 minutes is going to take an hour or more um, when you have to do that. Um, transportation is not always dependable and you need to take take uh, take account of that and you need to be aware of uh, cultural differences in terms of expectations around timeliness and let's see oh the one thing I would recommend is that make sure that you call participants prior to sessions to reduce sort of ambiguity around project expectations um, timeliness and and deadlines next Um, the other thing that I think it's um, important to do um, is plan for periodic retrospectives. We were doing two to three interview sessions a day. Um, one one day, I think we did six. Um, you know, and you know, we are collecting a ton of information at each of these sessions. Um, um, you know, there we you know typically did this in groups of. Um, four or five. Um, so, you know, one person, you know, would be sort of conducting a set of, asking a set of questions. Everybody else needs to be taking notes because each person, um, because there's so much information, there's no way any one of you can write it all down. And each of you are going to have your own perspective um, in, in collecting that information. So it's important for everyone to take their own notes. Um, uh, we think I think it was in, you know one of the things that we did after the first trip was that we had retrospectives after three or after every three or four engagements. Um, this helped the team a lot. Um, one, I mean, you know, because there was so much information, it was easy to just sort of forget who said what. So having these uh, retrospectives allowed us to sort of, you know, be clearer about you know what the user needs were for each particular um, participant. Um, we would go through and we would identify key findings for each session and, you know, what were the sort of top three takeaways. Um, this also gave us an opportunity to talk through sort of our script that we were using, you know, the topics that we wanted to cover and allowed us to make modifications based on sort of what we had learned, um, uh, you know, in previous sessions. So we would sometimes, you know, uh, lower the emphasis on you know some topics when we felt like we had gotten enough information about that particular topic, um, uh, and um, you know it also gave us an opportunity to sort of um, highlight the things that were surprising. I think that we would have lost those had we not done any sort of um, processing of the information until after we had gotten back to our home offices. All right. So, I mean, this is a picture of one of the teams at one of the retrospectives. There's the product is on the bar and we're sitting enjoying drinks after a long day. All right. Next. Um, all right. Uh, leveraging local expertise. Um, um, I was lucky that we had in-country teammates for sort of all of the sessions that we conducted. And having them available to work with us was critical. They can help sort of one identify users that that we can talk to. Um, you know, they help us select, you know, which clinicians, which radiologists, which rad techs at each of the institutions um, you know, have opinions, you know, are willing to talk and and you know have strong opinions about about uh, their processes and products. Um, they help with explaining sort of uh, the local context, the, um, you know, what the, what, what 
we're hearing means it from a cultural perspective. Um, and finally, and, and not the least of which is they provide logistic support um, uh, and assist with navigations between engagements, as well as, you know, important, particularly important to me, recommendations for dining and lodging. Um, when you go someplace that you've never been before, um, we don't tend to get to go to resorts on these trips, so it's important to have someone be able to point out uh, decent places to eat. There's not usually many Yelp reviews for the places we were going. All right, next, please. So this took, you know, this research took um, a global um, a global team, um, and I want to sort of recognize all of the folks that participated in this. In fact. There are so many of them, I couldn't get them all on one page. Next. That's the rest of them. So the, those are all of these people, you know, provided invaluable help to us as we were um, going about conducting this research around the world. And then finally, um, so, you know, in my in summary, in my view, global research is the UX, UX research is the only way to achieve an understanding of all of the clinician's needs, right? So we need to we need this to generate customer insights, mitigate clinical risks, and meet sort of the local needs of our users. All right, and last slide. And, and thank you. If you'd like to know about more about GE imaging, please go to the site, or you can contact me. Tim's, Tim's been, ah, there's a question. So the question from Paul is, how did you approach adapting the design and experience to the technology offered in those developing countries? All right. Um, so it was less about adapting to a specific technology than it was about the capabilities of the existing technology. So um, in the US, you know, we typically measure net network speeds and response, you know, network speeds in, you know, megabytes um, and, you know, you know, time it takes to transmit first image, um, you know, is, is in, in seconds. So um, given the, the file size, so we're, we, you know, we looked at trying to maintain the same first image speed but then had to um, downsample the first images sent in order to, to make that. So we adapted how we transmitted some of the images in order to adjust to sort of what was capable within that particular site. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answers, I mean, I hope you got the answer for that, Paul. Um, and if not, please feel free. If I didn't answer your question, please feel free to you know direct message me on Slack or throw me an email. I'm happy to try and answer your questions in greater detail. Then we've got the next question from Bob. Um, yeah. How did you approach variations within a geographical region? Example, there's a range of uh, I'm thinking of this cl clinical pro profiles, clinic profiles in the US alone. Did you seek out the variations within each region? Um, so the short answer is yes. So, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've probably observed 20 cardiologists in the U.S. Um, at various points in time. And, you know, each of them has their own distinct way of, of doing things. So I, we're, I tend to look, try to sort of, map out each person's workflow. Um, and then when we have sort of multiple maps, we will try to look across those workflows to identify commonalities and and try to do the 80% solution support, um, you know, what most of our users are doing. Again, you know, there's going to be, there are, there is absolutely variance within the US and there was variance within um, these developing countries. So like South Africa, we went, to three cities, Johannesburg, Durban, and um, Cape Town. And, you know, we tried to get, um, you know, a couple of clinicians, a couple of radiologists within different um, subspecialties at each location 
to um, so that we could do that looking at looking for commonalities and sort of identifying where the uh, variance was. So we did sample, but it, you know, it's an imperfect sampling. I, I wouldn't say we had seen the full range of, you know, clinician behavior in any of the countries that we looked at, but it's, it was better than what we had, um, which was nothing before. Okay. Um, Bob, if you have any, if you have any more or extended question to that, um, just let James know or reach out via Slack. Uh, the next question, a long one from Lucia. Which UX approach do you suggest for scenarios? Oh, wait, that popped down. Or which UX approach do you suggest for scenarios where the clinician is working directly in the image and wants to keep notes associated? Actually, one or more clinicians may want to add different notes to the same image and maybe compare all of them together. Yeah. Um, okay, so it depends on... So, Lucia, I think I've sort of... Um, Two different use cases and and I'll, I'll try to take them sort of sequentially so the one use case for me is um, that I've seen where we get multiple notes on a single set of images is um, multidisciplinary teams or tumor boards called different things depending on the institution where each clinician wants to make sure that their perspective is captured and um, we're lucky in that the products that I support allow sort of multiple report documents or text documents to be associated with each um, with each uh, with with a particular study it's also possible within the products to um, do GSPS which is essentially the screen state that the study was in. So if they've made any adjusted adjustments to window with window level, added any annotations, you can capture those as a separate um, file and um, and that gets added as a an additional series to the study so that everyone can go back and look at those. So that's sort of one case. The other case is when we're either doing sort of teaching or a consulting model where um, each clinician, you know, one clinician is sort of says, you know, this looks like disease ABC to me. And they send that sort of note and a particular image to a colleague. And, and then the colleague comes back and says, well, you know, I don't think it's ABC. I think it's XYZ. And they can have a discussion and those, those notes get um, made part of, of, of the record. So, um, and so if, and if the, each one has sort of their own sort of image capture, what we call key images, um, they can sort of bring them up and look at them either side by side in a, you know, two by one layout, or if there's, you know, you know, a, more than that, um, each, each clinician can have sort of a, its own pain, their own pain in the viewport to display. Uh, so they can do that side by side comparison. Does that, Answer your question, Lucia. Let's see what the comments say. Um, okay, so it's been answered. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so next question, uh, the last one, and this is from Frederick. Um, it's a two-part question. How did you make the cut with features or designs that are country-specific and those that are global? Secondary question, or B question. Also, how did you balance standardization versus customization in your product? Ah, uh, okay. Um, so, um, country specific global. All right. So, I, I think I don't. I, I don't know that we were as intentional um, as you are um, suggesting, Frederick. Um, so, I mean, we had a baseline product that we were building off of. So that became the sort of default global design. Um, what we ended up doing is identifying those places in the product where the global design did not meet local user needs. And we identified see that either new features 
or new settings that allowed local or regional um, users to so adapt the product so it better fit their workflow. Um, and in terms of standardization versus customization, it really came down to how much variability there was in terms of user needs and workflows around a particular feature. If we only saw, you know, you know, if 90% of the users did it one way, we didn't bother doing any customization. If we, you know, looked at it and there appeared to be, you know, four different equally valid ways of doing um, the work, um, and it and it, you know, that changed person by person, then that 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 feature became something that we could, you know, think about um, allowing uh, user customization for, so that each user's needs were met. Right. So if there, you know, if there was a predominant, overwhelming way of doing one things, it would be standardized. If it, if we saw a lot of variability, then we would look to see if we could customize it. Um, well, that, that, yeah, I'm hoping that answered your question, Frederick. Uh, it's been moved to, to the answered section. Awesome. Um, so those, and that looks like all the questions um, for now. If there are any further questions please reach out to James um, via Slack. Um, yeah, Frederick just responded now as well. Um, I think, uh, is Theo still here? Yeah, Theo's here. Um, I mean, thank you so much for the talk, James.